Welcome to another Safe Schools Rainbow Roundtable episode. I'm your host, Dr. Dan, and today we delve into a theme that resonates deeply within our community, LGBTQ plus representation in media and its evolution over the years. We'll journey through its evolution and its significant role in shaping societal perceptions and attitudes. In our historical overview, we'll travel back in time to understand the origins and transformation of queer representation in media, from stereotypical portrayals to rich, nuanced narratives. Then, in real life experiences, we'll share poignant fictional stories that illustrate the deep impact of media representation on individuals' lives. These narratives highlight the importance of seeing oneself reflected in the media. Moving forward, our Tools and Resources segment will spotlight seven exceptional shows and films authentically representing the LGBTQ experience, showcasing how diverse storytelling can enlighten and inspire. Finally, in the future outlook, we'll discuss Safe Schools initiatives and our vision for the future of LGBTQ representation, emphasizing the need for continued progress in diverse genres and spaces. From the small screens in our living rooms to the vast expanse of digital media, representation has been a powerful tool in shaping perceptions and attitudes. Studies have shown that exposure to queer characters in media can significantly increase acceptance and understanding. It's not just about being seen, it's about the quality of this visibility. Queer representation does more than just combat stereotypes. It normalizes and validates the existence of diverse sexualities and gender identities. It's crucial for our community, especially those still finding their place in the world, to see reflections of themselves and stories being told. But it's not just about the present. The true power lies in how these stories are told and how diverse and intersectional these representations are. As we explore this theme, let's remember that representation matters, not just in the quantity, but in the quality and diversity of the shared narratives. Now I'd like to give a moment for our esteemed panelists. This is Harold Marrero. He is the COO of Safe Schools and executive producer of Rainbow Roundtable. Harold, any first thoughts about LGBTQ and media? Well, we've come a long way, but there's still so much more for us to do. So I'm excited to be talking about this very important subject, and I'm sure that our diverse panel today will have a lot to say about it. Absolutely. And now we have Tiffany Williams. She's a social media expert, host of the television show Tiffany Explains It All, and the director of outreach for Safe Schools. Tiffany, I imagine your passion about LGBTQ plus in the media? Um, extremely passionate. <laughs> it's super important. As someone who is a bisexual woman, there has been some representation of women like me, but viewed in a more promiscuous, scandalous kind of way. Ooh. And we can be that, but we can be so much more. <laughs> so I look forward to talking about it today. I look forward to it too. <laughs> and then we have Eddie Mora. Eddie is a prominent social media influencer, host of the TV show, The Tea with Eddie, and a Safe Schools TV producer. Eddie, any thoughts on the tea of LGBTQ plus and media? I feel like we all watch TV, right? We, but we all want to feel represented. And I feel like there's still a lot of storylines that need to be told that are binge worthy for us to watch. So you know I'm excited for that in the future. Awesome. And now we have Harrison C. Davies. Harrison is the marketing manager at Bottom Line Concepts. Harrison, can you tell us a little bit more about Bottom Line Concepts? Well, I mean, Bottom Line Concepts, been in business for 15 years. It was founded as a contingency-based financial firm specializing in small businesses, which I think is a huge outlet for the LGBTQ community. Um, under BLC, big exciting announcement. We recently launched our um, partnership with Shark Tank's Mr. Wonderful. So that's been a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz surrounding that. Uh, recently pushed it to a much higher degree. Really excited to report on that. Um, that doesn't keep me busy enough. Uh, <laughs> uh, serve on the alumni board on my alma mater, Miami Country Day School, where I went for 13 years, and I'm a committee member of the Miami Children's Museum and Ellie's Army. So right. I'm just excited for you guys to have me here. Busy guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have Taya Harlan. She is the Public Relations Director of Reflect. Taya, can you tell us a little bit more about Reflect? So Reflect Collective is a nonprofit in Miami, and we help queer trans people of color who are domestic and sexual violence survivors. And we do different programming throughout the year. But our two biggest programs are our queer um, QTPOC grant, where we help them, and then um, Queer Fest, which is a variety show every April. 
That's yeah. awesome. You do important work in our community. Thanks, Taya. Thank you. Our next segment is tools and resources. Here we'll explore examples of LGBTQ plus representation that showcase authentic and diverse portrayals in today's media landscape. In this segment, we highlight seven shows and films that showcase authentic representations of LGBTQ plus experiences. The first is Moonlight. A critical and commercial success, Moonlight is a poignant portrayal of a young black man grappling with his identity and sexuality. The film's narrative spans three stages of Chiron's life, exploring themes of masculinity, vulnerability, and acceptance. Its historic Oscar win marked a significant milestone in LGBTQ representation in cinema. Then we have The Mitchells vs. The Machines. This animated film subtly weaves LGBTQ representation into its storyline. Katie, the protagonist, is a quirky, aspiring filmmaker who eventually reveals her queerness. Her character is voiced by Abby Jacobson, adding authenticity to the portrayal. The film's inclusive approach is a progressive step for mainstream children's entertainment. Then we have Rebelde. The reboot of this iconic Mexican telenovela introduces new characters and queer narratives, moving beyond the original limitations. Characters like Andy and Luca explore their sexuality and relationships offering a fresh and diverse perspective to a new generation of viewers. Then we have We Are Lady Parts. This British comedy series revolves around an all-Muslim women's punk band. The show is groundbreaking in its representation of Muslim women and includes a queer storyline with drummer Aisha. It's a refreshing portrayal that challenges stereotypes and offers insight into diverse experiences within the Muslim community. Then we have Steven Universe. This animated series is lauded for its progressive representation of gender and relationships. The gems, being genderless, engage in relationships and fusions that challenge traditional notions of gender and sexuality. The show's exploration of these themes in a family-friendly format has been influential in normalizing diverse identities for younger audiences. Then we have Severance. This dystopian drama, while primarily focused on the concept of work-life balance, unexpectedly includes a compelling queer love story. The relationship between Irving and Bert is a rare depiction of same-sex love between older characters, adding depth and diversity to the show's narrative. Finally, we have Yellow Jackets. This psychological thriller features, co features complex female characters, including Thaisa, who's a lesbian. Her sexuality is woven into both her teenage and adult storylines, influencing her actions and relationships. The show is notable for its raw and honest portrayal of its characters, including the exploration of queer identities. These shows and films play a vital role in advancing LGBTQ representation in media, offering diverse and complex portrayals that move beyond stereotypes and tokenism. They not only entertain, but also educate and inspire accepting and understanding. Panelists, which of these examples most resonates with you? How do, you? how do these shows and films contribute to a broader understanding and acceptance of LGBTQ plus identities? Well, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> Uh, since you mentioned Steven Universe, and that was like one of my favorite shows. I loved when they ex started to explain the relationship of how Garnet, which is one of the main characters that helped raise this human child, who's also like half human, half gem. Um, and they explain like their, their origin story and finding out that it was like two gems that fused together. And like in their storyline, Fusing together is like, it's okay, but like only for like a couple of hours and it's not like forever, but like they just can't deny each other. They like eventually start falling in love with each other and they fuse and it's kind of like this like forbidden thing. It's like, what? You can't be doing that. And they're just like, but we love each other. <laughs> <laughs> and it is just, it was like interesting because there's also like, you get to see even heartbreak, even with gems. One of the, the characters, um, they they have to fuse together. and But when they fuse together with this other gem, it becomes really toxic when they're together. Like, they become together. It's very toxic, like, union. 
but like one of them is like really addicted to their their fusion and i'm like this is so like underlining how relationships can be like you can be want to be with somebody and you don't even realize that they're very toxic you know and like there's just so much layering on top of that and the fact that they're they're genderless there's not like uh you know there's no female or male in that universe mm-hmm. you know and even like the the father of the main character he's like very openly like he's like oh you know just go with the flow he's like a long-haired like just 80s like old rocker <laughs> and i just i love like the concept of like the show of talking about like chosen family because eventually this child who nobody basically wanted because it's like you're half human half crystal you shouldn't really exist but he does and so but everyone who meets him ends up falling like in love with him not in like in a romantic sense but like they can't help but like him yeah. and isn't that what making a, like a chosen family is about? Like you, you get along with people and you're just kind of like, I want to hang out with you more often. Mm-hmm. You seem like a really cool mm-hmm. person, you know? And there's just, that's something that like the youth that don't have that supportive system at home. I mean, it's great when you, you do have family that to support you. And I think that's a, a blessing in and of itself, but not a lot of students have that. Not a lot of kids have that. And so getting to see that and maybe hoping that, okay, maybe one day, like, I'll have something like that, you know, later down the line. Yeah. For me, the show that resonated with me when that we just went through is Severance. You know, I was watching the show with uh, my husband. And um, he, the, <laughs> this character just happened to be gay. And he was an older guy. And he was in love with another older guy in the, in the, in the show. Then... You know, I'm not going to do a spoiler alert like, like Tiffany over here. <laughs> spoiler. But, um, but it was so... You had no idea and then it happens and you're like, oh, this is so refreshing. And, and, I, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't change the story. It doesn't do anything. But it is portrayed in such a loving and caring way that, you, that it's like you're seeing every representation, like young, middle, and old, in that space and it's not a big deal you know no one is dying no one is you know there's there's not nothing big going on they just they just love each other and that was that was pretty pretty nice i really enjoyed that what i like about that is that it's an honest portrayal of like the lgbt on screen what might be controversial is that i hate when tv shows reboot an old series and then they force the representation they force a gay character or anything and it's like might as well not add it because if it wasn't there in the beginning you're just doing it to get more views and then just getting our money, you know? Yeah. So, you have an yeah. example? Of those? Um, well, they mentioned Rebelde, but what I like about that reboot is that it, it was a different plot from the original one. So, it gave a, an original storyline. But if they were, if they would have made like the Disney reboots, like, let's say, and they had a, a gay character for no reason, then I think that's forced. And it's like, just make a new storyline for a gay character, you know? Yeah. Exactly. And not just add it just to add it. And, have that um, bonus. Rainbow story, capitalism. You know? Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but don't make Hercules gay. Something uh, I've <laughs> something I've always been. I, I want to hear your thoughts because I don't. I'm unsettled about it. But what are your thoughts about non queer actors playing queer roles, like Brokeback Mountain, as an example? I think, I think it's a little bit complicated. I personally feel a little uncomfortable when I see non trans women particularly historically a lot of men like cis men have played trans women and that makes me very uncomfortable because my life is not the same as a cis man I go through completely different experiences and I think that should be respected and with that I think that should be in media um I do wanted to mention the media that I liked in the the lineup that we had um I think Moonlight is a phenomenal film I've seen it probably three or four times. I've had mm-hmm. to watch it because I'm a women and gender studies student and we talk about it in probably most of my queer classes that I've taken. It has now become somewhat of a standard for academia when studying queer films. And it's such a beautiful film. I personally didn't like it the first time I watched it because I was looking for more of a romance story, but I love it now because it's it's so much more than that. It's about the intersectionalities and of Chiron and his experience as being a young black man in Miami where we live 
And it's it's such an amazing movie, and it definitely deserved that Oscar. Despite what was awarded, awarded. originally. Yeah, <laughs> that was a mess. I was like, <laughs> but that is a mess. I, I, I'm still so excited. It was almost like, oh, God, y'all went in that direction again for the, you know, what, 81st time. Yeah. And then to have the movie like Moonlight kind of go up and grab it, you know, mm-hmm. Rectified yeah, it I think it was La La Land it was, originally. It was La, La, yes, it and I was like, La, La La Land, the one movie that's been smelled a million, yeah. you know, you know, film, and it, it was it was quite exciting uh, to see that kind of rectified. And also, I think if anything, it brought more publicity and, and to move my, you know, yeah. where a lot more people were watching. And you know, forget it, winning Best Picture, it won Best Picture, and a amazing, interesting uh, phenomenon. So. Yeah. Um, to answer also what you asked, and it's um. I, I don't know because acting is such a, it's, it's, it's a you know it's a, it's, it's like an art. It's an art form. It is an art form. Yeah, I know. Yeah. It, but it, but in, in in being an art form, I don't think it really matters who the person behind that is because they're portraying a whole new a whole another person through their through their work through their art. But I feel like I will be okay with it only if you can have like a trans person playing a you know heterosexual character you know and when you have like a like a trans woman playing you know uh, a heterosexual woman that that's great because then there's 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 equality everything you know it's 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 not just it's not just one-sided is everybody is able to play whatever character they feel that they can play the best and mm-hmm. it doesn't matter who the person is behind the mask it's all about the person that they're playing which is the mask so I think if that's the case, then then it will be fine. But I do feel like there should be more people playing, uh, like more LGBTQ plus people playing LGBTQ plus characters, because that those roles usually go to, you know, cisgendered people, yeah. and that's not. I don't think that's the, that's that's right. I like I said. I think it really depends. Like sexuality, it's a little different, because like, but a gender, that's. That's that's a whole nother <laughs> different yeah. like experience. I think sexuality, both are more fluid, but gender is more of like a complete identity, if that makes sense. Where yes, yeah, sexuality we make it our identity, but it's not your your living that life of that. Sex. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, that. what about the Danish girl? That that was probably considered recently a fairly missed opportunity. Yeah. yeah. And the yeah. individuals but involved was, and yeah. Eddie Redman, who mm-hmm. was nominated for not mm-hmm. like has gone back and said, yeah, that, that was, you know, not, you know, and that was one year before Moonlight. I know. So interesting. I know a lot of people like I've not a lot, but I've heard some people in the trans community also have issues with trans women playing um, drag queen characters like, um, I know that they did like a a Fox special of Rocky Horror in like 2016, I think it is. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, I don't remember, but I believe it was a really big trans woman. Um, I don't know if it was, it might have been Laverne Cox as well. I'm not sure. Yeah, but she played Frankenfurter and a lot of people were very uncomfortable with that. And I, I kind of understood their point, but I'm also kind of like, uh like because with older films our our terminology has changed so much even in the past 20 30 years when it comes to the queer community so i think with stories like that they are very fluid Mm -hmm. yeah and i definitely i i agree with both of you what you were saying earlier i do agree with taya in the sense that i do think if the character is a trans woman or a trans man. It should be played by someone who is trans. Um, but I also understand and agree with you, Harold, in the saying that as an actor, acting is an art form. I think an, an example for uh, what I'm going to bring up is... Um, uh, woo, oh my gosh, I can't remember how to say it. <laughs> the one that has the two, the, two, the three drag queens. Two Wong Fu. Two Wong Fu. They were all straight men that were playing drag queens, granted. and But they all took the role seriously. You know, they weren't making a mockery of these people that are that are real. There are real drag queens that, like, that is just who they are, you know. And I think there is a line 
when it comes to playing characters that you have to basically do it. If you're going to do it, do it, like, do your research. Like, go into the community, talk to people, get to, like, pick their brains. Because if you're going to portray this character, you want to do it to the best justice that you can do, you know? And even there will be times where you'll be given, you know, a role. Like, if someone's like, oh, we want you to play a, a transgender man or woman. And that, at that point, is the actor's point. Is like, okay, do I really want to take this role? Or should I actually just then not say no and be like, you should actually hire someone who's actually part of that community to mm -hmm. act out this role. If you want real representation. Yeah. Yeah, that's like uh, in... Again, I go back to Grey's Anatomy because I feel like Grey's Anatomy really did start bringing these queer characters in, mm -hmm. but they missed an opportunity with Georgie. Like Georgie was is, is a, is a gay actor who was then portraying as this straight person with Callie, and then Callie becomes a lesbian and well, bisexual, and then um, you know Georgie has to leave the show because of like some backstage drama with his queerness, and that to me was a missed opportunity because they could have completely made Georgie you know into a gay the gay character of the movie of the show and i do feel like it's it's at least it seems like it was easier to introduce lesbian characters like two women together than it was introducing gay characters at first um because only grace anatomy only recently had they really had you know space for gay characters before which is you know bisexual and lesbian women um and that's a missed opportunity but i understand society maybe wasn't ready for it two guys they were just ready for two girls and there's, there's a whole nother we can do a whole nother round table on why that is um but but yeah that was i think this opportunity there one point i want to bring up is that um it's hard to spe it's yeah it's not fair to speculate on the actor's sexuality because the the boys from heart supper the fans got obsessed with one of them and he ended up coming out later and mm -hmm. but he he was outed basically mm. and then when red and white and royal blue also came out people found out that one of the actors they were they were hating on them because like, why are they both straight and playing gay characters? It turns out one was closeted, was married, and then the fans found that out and then just outed him. So I feel like it's pretty unfair on the actors to just out actors on their sexuality. I feel like it's an art form and let them do what they have to do. At the end of the day, they're all theater kids. So yeah. you never know. Yeah. You never yeah. know. <laughs> they're all queer. <laughs> <laughs>